last time y'all fell in love? Remember your first love? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Been too long? <laughs> Chris, you know your first love? Not, not, it's too early? It's been too long and too early. Keep falling. When was the last time you fell in love with Jesus? You know, I love singing that song. And I say it over and over again. I can sing that all day long. That's just one of the songs you can be in the shower. Before you know it, the hot water just ran out. And you ain't even got no soap on the, on the little, I got a poofy thing. I got one of those little poofy things. Sometimes when you think about it, you just, when you think about what he's done for you, and we talked about that last week, you know, we always, always brought you through. Like, Man, I just, over and over. He keeps blessing me over and over. You're just falling in love with him over and over again. And, you know, and when you're in love with Jesus, can't nobody tell you nothing about him, N- nothing, nothing bad about him. When, 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 you, when some of you young girls were ducking that knucklehead, and you, but daddy, I love him. I know he's a drug dealer, but yeah, he loves me. He does it so he can buy me. Yeah, you, you was in love with him. You don't want to hear nothing nobody else had to say. I know he carried two guns, but one's for me. Yeah, I'm in love. Love is blind. When you're in love with Jesus, <laughs> we get to the lesson in a minute, but I'm, I'm in love a little bit right now. When you're in love with Jesus, can't nobody tell you nothing. Nothing about Jesus. No matter what you're going through, no matter what's been happening, no matter who you're fighting with, I'm in love with Jesus. He keeps blessing me over and over again. Amen. That's why I had to sing that song. I'm a little bit sick this morning, so I'm going to ask y'all to bear with me. I got some halls in my pocket. And they're the old halls that the rapper's still stuck to them. You know. So bear with me. We're going to go to John chapter 6. Let's study the word a little bit this morning. You got time for a word? John chapter 6. We're going to go verses 1 through 13. You may be familiar with this story. A lot of people call it Jesus feeds the multitude or Jesus feeds the 5,000. The top of my Bible right here says 5,000 fed. If you haven't, say amen. And the Bible says, after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Jesus always had a group of people following him. And it's always a multitude, large flocks of people following Jesus no matter where he went. Then Jesus went up into the mountain and he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing the large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip. He said, Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself already knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to even receive just a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have these people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. Jesus ain't raking no plates out. You know, when I was coming up, you, you didn't take a plate to the garbage can. It wasn't no throwing no whole piece of chicken away. When Mama was in the kitchen cooking and you heard the pots rattling, you know, you was up in your room doing whatever or outside and you could smell something coming through the screen. You said, Mama, what you cooking? And she didn't, she didn't give you a, a menu. She said she's cooking some food. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you was happy to get that food. And when you sat down, my, my granddaddy used to, we used to sit down at the kids' table. Did we still have kids' tables? We used to sit down at the kids' table. All me and my little cousins were sitting there eating, and we got one big cup of Kool-Aid to share. And, and we're sitting there talking, and my granddaddy come around the corner, I want less talking, more eating. That's how he always talked. He was waving his finger. I want less talking, more eating. We started eating, so we see so we could eat the fastest. But we wouldn't dare get up from that table and try and rake something in the trash. 
Because if you didn't finish your food that night, guess what you was having for breakfast in the morning? You could be having collard greens for breakfast. You ever had collard green cereal? Jesus didn't waste nothing. He said, verse number 11, or I'm sorry, verse number 12, he said, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves were left over by those who had eaten. Jesus can take the little that you have and make it too much. He can take what you think is too little and he can turn it into too much. We get accustomed to God being, you know, he's, he's magnificent. He, he's, you know, he, we, we know him to do big things. He's, he's the God of the universe. He created the world. We, we, we've been talking about creation a little bit, you know, in, in, uh, in Wednesday night Bible study. And, you know, and the kids are studying in school and they talk about the Big Bang Theory and, and creation. You know, I, I love debating it with some of these, you know, scientists and biologists. And no matter how much we think we can come up with, no matter how smart these scientists are, no matter how far they go to the moon and come back or send telescopes and satellites to wherever, they can't create anything. They can't create anything. They can make something. You know, they, can, they, can, they can make a space shuttle. My mama can make some biscuits. That's not nothing special. They can't create something out of nothing. No, no, the number one reason why is because they can't even get nothing. When's the last time you saw some nothing? I, I'm not talking about your bank account at the end of the month. I, I'm talking because there might be something. There might be something in there, even if it's a negative. Little something is something. But when's the last time you've seen nothing? I'm talking about nothing. So how are they going to create something out of nothing if they can't even get the nothing part? They want to argue about what God created, how it came to be. They want to say two atoms came together and was floating around in space. Who made the space? Without God, there ain't even no space. He reached back and grabbed something out of nothing, threw it into some, made somewhere out of nowhere, and created a world. They took these two atoms, and they want to bang them together, and the world created. You know, well, who made the atoms? We just, God creates something out of nothing. He's the God of the great. He's the God of the universe. He's the God of the magnificent. He, 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 he spins the world on his finger at just the right speed, you know, at just the right angle, just the exact right distance from the sun. But then he'll take the time from doing that, and he'll come and, and, he'll come and pay that rent at just the right time for you. Just those little tiny things. He's the God over the magnificent. He's the God over the big, just like he's the God over the little. He's always going to take time for the little. We doing all right? All right. Let me pull up my notes. Let's get into the lesson. This is one of his biggest miracles. This is the only miracle. Some people say this is his biggest miracle. This is the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The only one. How many miracles did Jesus perform? Probably hundreds, thousands. But only one of them is listed in all four Gospels. And, and when you read this, we're, we're reading from John, but when you're studying, read all four of them. Everybody says, everybody tells the story a little bit different. It's all the same story. It's all right, but they all got different details. We're going to jump into them a little bit today. But we're looking at John here. John chapter 6 it's kind of Jesus' anthem. You know, John chapter 6, Jesus is doing a lot of things. He starts off performing his biggest miracle, feeding this multitude. He walks on water right after this, right after they leave this area. We won't even get into it that much, but he leaves this area. He tells the disciples to go on without him, and he'll meet them later. You know, he goes off to pray. He just found out his cousin, John the Baptist, was killed by Herod. You know, he needs some time to himself. When he, went, when he went here, before the multitude came, he was going to get some time to himself. He'd been preaching all day, been healing people all day. Disciples went out on the boat like they told him to. They'd been out for about three miles. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, they see Jesus walking on the water towards the boat. And they were scared to death. This is all in John chapter 6. I made Sierra read it last night. 
He's telling me all kinds of stories. I was a little proud this morning. Have your, have your kids read the Bible. They'll surprise you how much they take in. But let's look at the text. Verse number one. Uh, who's got it? We're going to go. We're going to go slow. Uh huh. Okay, hold on. So from Capernaum to Galilee is about four miles. Um, they, the, these, these people, he's been in Capernaum and he's been performing these miracles and they've been watching him. They've been seeing what he's going to do and now he's gotten tired. He's about, he gets on the boat and he starts heading across the Sea of Galilee and he's, he's going to the other side. Now, they can see where he's going, right? Jesus is trying to get away. He needs a break, but they can see. It's just like the, the lake over here. If I, if I start to sail across, it ain't no secret where I'm going. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about the city that they were in, Tiberias. Tiberias was not a place where anybody wanted to live. If they had a choice, you wouldn't be there. The reason is Herod, we talked about Herod last week, Herod built this city. And he named it Tiberias after the, the current Roman emperor. And he made it the capital of Galilee. Now, when he built this city, he built it on top of a sacred burial ground. He built it on top of a, a cemetery. That made it unclean for any Jews to live there. So no Jews wanted to live there. So now he's built this great city. He named it after the emperor, and he can't get nobody to stay there. So what does he do? He goes around to all the rural areas of Galilee, and he makes the people move from the, out in the suburbs and come into the middle to, to live in Tiberias. But that still wasn't enough. This was just a handful of people. So then he takes slaves, free slaves, and criminals and packs them in there too. So this is around A.D. 15. So Tiberias, you've got this poverty-stricken community full of crime. Unemployment is bad. Nobody wants to be there. Does this sound familiar? Nobody wants to be there. They're being forced to live there. And this is the group of people that Jesus is talking to. These people are in search of something. These people need something. They're desperate for something. There's no food. Every now and then when the people were about ready to riot because they were so hungry, Herod would go ahead and put out some bread distribution centers just to keep them quiet for a little while. That's the kind of environment that these people were living in in the city of Tiberias. So Jesus gets on the boat. He starts crossing the water. These people are so desperate for a savior. What do they do? Let's read. Uh huh. They don't want to leave Jesus. You know, when, when, when you see what Jesus can do and, and you, you want him to help you, you'll go anywhere for him. These people, he, Jesus is going across the sea, four miles. Now, I didn't do good in geometry, but last time I checked, when you go across a circle, the, the shortest distance from anywhere is, is a straight line, right? Now, they didn't have a boat. The Bible says they did what? They walked. So Jesus is going from here to here. They got to walk all the way around here, nine miles. He's starving people, no food, nothing. They just see what he can do. They want to see him some more. They see him take off on the boat. He's trying to get away from them, and they follow him nine miles around the sea. Keep reading. Uh huh. Okay. Okay, why is that important? Why did the Bible throw that little, you know, six-word sentence in there? The, the Passover was near. Now, when, when, when you see a large group of people going somewhere, what do, what do we do? If, if we was open up that door right now and people was walking down the street and it wasn't Martin Luther King Day, what would we, we'd be like, what's, what's going on? You know, what, what, what y'all do? Especially if they was running. You know, we, then we might not even ask what's going on. We, we might be saying, why, why are we running? Going down the street, they see a large multitude of people. Now, Passover is going on. It's about to happen. There's already people traveling to Jerusalem along these same roads that they're walking around the Sea of Galilee. So people are already on the roads to be traveling to Jerusalem. So you've got a, you got a multitude of people, large group of people traveling from Tiberias, and they're picking up people along the way. Because when people see you excited about Jesus, when people see you excited about God, they're going to want to jump in with you. Gonna, 
Why, why are you so excited? What's the hurry? What's he, what is he going to do? I want to see. Let me come with you. We're going to Jerusalem, but forget that. we got to go see. He did what? He, he, he healed a blind man? He, he, he cured leprosy just by talking about it? Let's go see what's going on. So now the multitude has grown. And they said Jesus was laying on the side of the, of the mountain with his disciples. What's the rest of the verse say? Uh huh. Okay, so in verse number five it says Jesus lifted up his eyes. That means he was trying to get it in, right? When he he's been working all day, he's laying back. You know, they on the hill. Picture this in your mind. They laying on the hillside. The Bible says it's a grassy area. They just got off the boat. He's been working. His disciples have been talking to him, asking him questions. He's laying there and he's trying to get a little get a little wink. But then it's, here comes all this large group of people. Walking nine miles, probably pretty loud, group of people that long, that large. They said Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he saw those people coming. Now, what do you think the disciples were thinking when they saw this large group of criminals, poor people, unemployed, coming after them, and they just left, basically chasing them? What do you think the disciples were thinking? Man, we need to jump back on that boat. We can cross the other side. Maybe we need to just go to the middle of the sea and just stay there, get away from these people. But what, what, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, hey, Philip. And Jesus does everything with a, with a reason. He asked Philip for a reason. This is Philip's hometown. There's 12 disciples there. He could have asked any one of them. If, if I was to go to Nebraska and we're sitting there after church and then somebody said, hey, Brother Burns, you know, what's a good place to eat? Like, I, I don't know. Is there Popeyes around? I'm not from here. You know, I don't know. I'm not from here. And that could have been the response he could have got from one of the other 11 disciples. But if you ask Brother Hall's father, hey, was a good place to eat? He'll tell you the hole in the wall where they got the best biscuits at, right? Because he's from there. He knows the spot. So he asked Philip. He said, Philip, this is your hometown. Look at all these people. Where can we go get them some bread to eat? And what does Philip say? Next verse. Uh huh. Okay, hold on. So, how many times have we have we talked about this already? Jesus already knows. God already knows what's going to happen. He's waiting on you to realize what's going to happen. He's waiting on you to say, "This is what's going to happen, God." Yeah. He says, "Philip, you know, I, I see him laying. He's got his legs laid back. He's cro- got his legs crossed, just chilling up there. All these people are coming. They probably." Halfway running, halfway tired, carrying people. He couldn't make it. And he's like, Philip, what you going to do? What, what, what are we going to do? And he's probably smiling. He got a little grin. He ain't worried. Disciples are worried. You know, they're like, well, what about our food? They gonna, he, is Jesus going to give him our food? What about what, 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 what are we going to eat? But Jesus is laid back and he's smiling. Philip, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to get some bread for these people? And Philip says what? Mm-hmm. They said eight months' wages. That's a lot of money. Think about however much you make. I don't care who it is. If that's how much you make in a month, times that by eight, that's a lot of money. All that money ain't even going to be enough, the Bible says, to give them just a little nibble, all these people. Now, how many people was it? How many people really was it? Was it 5,000? This is why you got to read your Bible thoroughly. you got to study your Bible diligently. Turn to Matthew chapter 14. A lot of people think it was just 5,000. Now, 5,000 is a lot. Amen? But the Bible says, Matthew chapter 14, and this is, this is Matthew's account of the, uh, of the incident. Verse number 21. The Bible says, Matthew says, that there were 5,000 men. It was 5,000 men, not including the women and the children, like my grandma said, the children. Now, you assume that each man has one wife, and let's assume that they got, let's say, two kids. You know, and every now and then there'll be a Hall family. How many people you got now? 
Remember, these people are talking about the Savior. There ain't nothing else going on. You know, the, the, they ain't got no bowl series to watch. The playoffs ain't going on. Jesus is in town. They didn't clear out the city. Everybody is coming to see him. He said, he said get the kids up. We'll, we'll worry about it. Do your homework later. Let's go. We got, we're finna go see Jesus. Come on, girl. Get them kids. You're looking at about 20,000 people. Y'all been to a Nuggets game? How many people fit in that arena? 16? I mean, a whole lot of people. We're talking about an arena full of people, right? We're talking about Joel Osteen thinks he's bad, you know, because he's got the biggest church in America. I don't know how many people it is, but Jesus is walking around, got people. How many people you think going to follow Joel Osteen nine miles around to see a Galilee? Barefoot, carrying their kids. If, if, they're, if they're low on gas, they might not make it to service. Jesus Christ is preaching, and he's done preaching, and they still won't follow him. Twenty-something thousand people. Twenty thousand people are following, coming up to Jesus, and Jesus looks at Philip and says, what are we going to do? So Philip says, Lord, eight months of wages ain't even enough to feed all these people. We don't got no money. We spent all that money on that wine down at the wedding, you know, back in Canaan, remember? We, we, don't, we don't got no money. And then, so Philip is already, what, down God. He's not putting his faith in God. But what's the next verse say? Uh-huh. Peter's brother. I like how the Bible talks like we talk. You remember Andrew? Peter's brother. Keep talking. I, I, I just love that little, that helps me read it. I can relate to that talk. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're looking at these people coming. They're probably about a mile away. We've got this little boy here. You know, 20,000 people takes a while to get there. You know, so they're coming in droves. This little boy, this is the only little tiny boy, got his little lunch box. They didn't found, they didn't snuff it out. He's got five pieces of bread and two little fish. And Andrew said, "What? What is that? You ever, you ever, you ever come down? You ever wake up in the morning, you feel so hungry, and you go down to your refrigerator, you open it up, and you want to get some cereal, and it's like that much milk. You're like, what? What is that? Yeah, he's like." And then you go get the, the little box and you pour out the Cheerios and two little Cheerios hit the bowl. You slam. What is that? What is that going to do? I'm starving. I've been working all day. I didn't have no dinner last night. What is, what is this two Cheerios going to do? And Andrew said, he got five pieces of bread, two fishes. What is that? So to 20,000, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm about to show you a little illustration. What if it was... Uh, what if, it was, what if it was potluck Sunday, right? And I, after we got done eating, we got everybody here. You know, everybody shows up on potluck, you know. And uh, as soon as we say amen, everybody head downstairs. First thing they see, only thing they see on the table. See, I ain't going to have no lunch this week. Five little pieces of bread. Y'all think I went to the fish house? Two little fishes. The Bible says little fish, right? He didn't, say, he didn't, say, he didn't leave it. He wasn't like, oh, they had trout and salmon. The Bible said little fish. We got some little fish. We walk downstairs. We got 100 people in here. You see five pieces of bread and two little fish. And we're talking about, let's bless the food. But all me walk down and be like, what is that? <laughs> what is that to so many? What did he say? He said, Andrew said, what is that to so many? Don't eat my bread. All right. Where we at? Uh-huh. Okay. God is never going to bless you until there's some order. A lot of times we start, we, we focus too much on the problems, right? We look at our problem instead of looking at the problem solver. We're looking at we only got this instead of looking at who else we got. We focus on what we got instead of who we got. Y'all seen that Coke commercial when the guy says, it's, it's, it's a Coke commercial, and uh, they're like, you got the job. And they go, he goes, and? And there's like stock options. And then the guy's got like a yacht and 
you know, money all over the place. And, and the guy, he gives the kid the ice cream cone. He, he gives him the ice cream cone. And he goes, and? And he puts sprinkles and fudge on there. And the kid's like, you got this problem and the Savior. You got marriage problems. You got $24 in your bank account. You got no, no gas in the car. But you got Jesus. Stop focusing on what you got and start focusing on who you got. That $24 in the bank account, you, you ever been so broke with $3 you counted over and over again? It's still three. And you look at that snack machine, you're like, 75 cents for some chips. When you don't have nothing is when you start appreciating something, right? Last week I told you, people who, the, the people who complain the most are the people who are blessed the most. But people who don't got nothing, they don't complain about nothing. When you, if you, just, if you got, this is a bad example. I shouldn't talk about gas. Y'all know I ran out of gas one Wednesday night on the way up here. That might be a bad, but I still had Jesus. I mean, I had a, I had an eighth of tank of gas and Jesus, but I just didn't listen to what he said. He said, stop and get some gas. Before, I was like, no, we can make it. My wife was like, we should probably stop and get some gas. I'm like, no, we're good. We're good, woman. Just Am I clear on the right? We're good. We get that last hill, and we wasn't good. <laughs> we were walking up that hill, and it was cold. <laughs> but all had to come help us out after the after Bible study. Still had Jesus, but we wasn't, I wasn't listening to him. Lord have mercy. I was calling him, though. But Jesus, help me. Please don't let And I still hear about it. Oh, hey, gas ain't looking a little low. What you going to do? All right, I got it. But you don't look at your problems. Look at the problem solver. Amen? The little boy was the only one who was prepared. He's the only one carrying his little lunchbox. God took a little bit of, a little boy who had a little bit of food, and he took some disciples with a little bit of faith and solved the big problem. It frustrates God when you don't trust him. It frustrates him. How many times had he shown the disciples already what he could do? How many times? How many, remember when he was in the, in the boat, in the bottom of the boat, and, and the, the sea was raging, and they, they thought they were going to die? And he, they went up there and down there, and they woke him up. Jesus, are you, you just going to sleep through this? You going to let us drown? He didn't say nothing to him. He just went up there and said, peace be still, and calm the waters. And he said, How, why do y'all have such little faith? Didn't you just see me raise Lazarus from the dead? Didn't you just see me get grandma out of the hospital? How do you think you made it this far? How do you think you made it to 60 years old? How do you think you made it to 50, to 40? I shouldn't have made it past nine as crazy as I was when I was a kid. But we forget so fast, we forget all the things that he's got us through. How many times does he have to show you over and over and over again until you start to trust him? Does that stop him from doing it? Mm -mm. He'll do it again. That's why the song says over and over. And that's why he asks you. He wants to see if you've learned yet. Philip, what are we going to do, Philip? How are we going to feed these people? When you take the little that you have and give it to God, just watch what he does with it. When I was a little boy, my dad used to do that little coin trick. You know, he'd take, take the coin, make it disappear. And then pull it from behind your ear. You know, and I was like, oh my, wow, it's amazing. So what, what's he going to do next? I, I went and got everything I could find in my room and gave it to him just to see what he was going to do. Make that disappear, Daddy. You know, which, make my sister disappear. Do something with her. When you trust him, when you, when you know what he can do, you just give him what, he ha- what you have and watch him work. Here, here's, here's my little $24 guy. That's all I got left. What you going to do? I can't wait to see. You're going to turn, turn that $24 into a full tank of gas? I know gas prices are going down, but $24 ain't going to fill up nobody's tank. Give, the, give that $24 to God and watch what happens. Right? How many times does he got to show you over and over again? Exodus 
Everybody's got a credit report. I've been told that you're supposed to pull your credit report once a year at least. I don't like doing that because I don't like getting depressed that often. But they say you should pull your credit report at least once a year. They say you should pull all three of them because two of them might be good and one of them might be bad. Y'all seen that commercial with the 700 guys and then the, the one guy's 500 score real short? One of them might be bad. When's the last time you went online and pulled God's credit report? And all three of them. You pull all three of them because you, you pull one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. The reason people check your credit when you go to get that car or when you go to get that house is because whatever you've done in the past is a pretty good indicator of what you're going to do in the future. So when you pull God's credit report, and it's, it's sitting on all these pews right here, that's his credit report. Mine's that thick too, but mine's got negative in it. That's all positive feedback in his credit report, all them books. When you look at what he's done in the past, that's a pretty good indicator of what he will do for you in the future. Just reading the Bible will tell you that, but you don't even, you don't even have to do that. Just look at your life. If you look at what he's done for you in the past, it will be a good, pretty good indicator of what he will do for you today and in the future. Pull God's credit report. Don't forget what he's done for you. Sometimes, sometimes the kids got more sense than we do. You know, after, after church gets out and, and Brother Drayton does the announcement, as soon as, the, soon as they say, hit the door, them kids going to be out there ripping and running. But you ever, you ever come outside and you, you see Jose sitting or, or uh, Isaiah sitting on the, de- on the steps over there, you know, with his, with his head down? And you're like, what's, what's up, Isaiah? What's the problem? And he's like, man, I, I don't know how we're going to get this rent paid. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know how, we, I'm, I don't know how we're going to get this, this lunch for, for school next week. Kids don't worry about that. Why? Because they trust Daddy, right? They know that Daddy's going to take care of them. The kids out there ripping and running because they know they don't got nothing to worry about because Daddy is going to take care of them. Christians should be out there ripping and running because they don't got nothing to worry about because they know that the Father is going to take care of them, no matter what. It's not our job to worry about that stuff. It's not our job to be concerned about where the rent's going to come from. He already told you he's going to provide it. So what you worried about? If your kids came up to you and questioning you every single day, well, well, we're going to get a gas for this car. You know, I got a basketball game tomorrow. Which you, you'd probably bust them upside his head, right? Boy, go sit down somewhere. And what did God tell the people to do? He said what? He said, tell the men to sit down. When we, when we ripping and running as kids, my grandma used to say, sit down. Shut your mouth and sit down. God says, tell the men to sit down. He is not going to bless you unless there is some order. God don't work in chaos. If you want God to bless you, you got to do what he tells you to do. The Bible said God told him to sit down. There's a lot of grass. Some of us, you know, some of us, we're going to be complaining about the grass. Well, this is my, this is my white clothes. I'm, is it all right if I stand? You know, I'm allergic to grass. Or what kind of grass is that? Is, is what the grasshoppers and bugs? I don't, do, I don't do spiders. You know, God said sit down. We always come up with excuses. He said sit down. He sat him down. He's made every man sit down. And then what happened? Uh-huh. The men sat down. Mhm. Okay. Uh huh. Holy. So he took he took what the little boy had. Now you, you know if if I was that little boy, I don't know if I would have been so generous. You know, I, I'm like, hold up. You know, I'm the only one who came prepared. You know, hold on, Jesus. You know, I'm I'm trying to walk off. They talking about it. I'm walking off. They're like, hey, hey, Bobby. I'm like, huh? You know, he's like, let me see that bread. And I'm I'm licking on it and stuff now, trying to. So I don't want nobody. This is my bread. I, I just walked nine miles too. It's like ain't no, all these grown folk ain't nobody brought their lunch. But he gave it to Jesus. And what's the first thing Jesus did? He gave thanks. Why is God gonna bless you with the big house, and you don't give him thanks for the little house? Be thankful for what the little bit that he's already gave you. He ain't going to give you the Lincoln when you don't keep the oil change in the hoopty. 
If all you do is complain about your hoopty, I used to love my hoopty. We be I just, we broke so many laws packing people packing people into that car, riding out, had house speakers in there. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We were thankful for that car. Be thankful for what you have. When you give thanks and you appreciate what you have, that's when he's going to bless you with more. If you, if you can't handle a little bit, how are you going to handle a lot? Talking about you want a mansion, robe, and crown, and you don't keep the small house clean. Give thanks for what he's already given you. The Bible says he took it and he gave thanks, and then what? Hold on. He said he distributed it to who? Who was seated. That means some people might not have sat down. You know how some of us are. I told you. Uh, y'all, yeah, y'all go ahead and sit down. You know, I'm going I'm to stand back here. You know, they, God's going to let you do what you want to do. He's going to tell you what to do, and then he's going to let you make your decision. He told them to sit down. You know, they probably was like, I don't know what he planned on doing, but we'll see. it takes a lot of time to sit 20,000 people down. It takes a lot of time to feed that many people. But the Bible says he fed them who were seated. These little tiny things in the, in the scripture that just, just grab my attention. Because we, how many times have you read that and just ignored that part that they were sitting down? Okay, yeah, they were sitting down. Don't sit down. But he fed those that did what he told them to do. They were seated. And then the Bible says they did what? He did the same with the fish. So they ate until what? As much as they wanted. It was an all-you-can-eat picnic from this little boy's lunchbox. And I, and I was laughing. I was like, man, I, I could see me and Reggie and Brother Hall, you know, sitting down there on our little blanket, you know, fish bones stacked up, you know, you're rubbing the stomach, getting a little sleepy. Man, I told you. I told you to come. I told you. I didn't I tell you what was going to happen when we got here? Nine miles. That ain't nothing. We didn't got more food than we could eat. Trust Jesus. You give him your little bit, and look what he does. You think any of them were expecting that? They didn't go there with any expectation. They didn't go there knowing that Jesus was going to feed them. They just followed him. They just followed him. They trusted him. And he made something out of nothing. That's something that man can't do. Stop trusting man and start trusting God. Keep reading, uh, Reggie. Mm-hmm. Let nothing be wasted. So he took these this little boy's lunchbox. Uh, Brother Hall, give me Ephesians 3.19. He took this little boy's lunchbox, two little fish, five pieces of bread, fed 20,000-something people, and then they had leftovers. He took the too little, and he made it, too much. And then he said he filled up how many baskets? Twelve. Now, what a coincidence that he had 12 partners with him, 12 disciples. They didn't eat all this food. Everybody didn't eat all they can eat. They didn't fill it up. And they got enough left over to carry them on the rest of their way. How did he do it? It doesn't make sense. I, I don't understand how, how he could do that. You know, we, we, as, as men, we try and figure everything out. It doesn't make sense. That story can't be true. How, how could he feed so many people from just so little bit? You know, all it takes is just a little bit of faith. Jesus said if you have faith as little as a mustard seed, right? I got a mustard seed right here. Y'all see it? If you have faith as little as a mustard seed, you can move what? A mountain. All it takes is your little bit, the little bit you got, with the little bit of faith you got, is all it takes for him to do big things. It took that little bit. Fed everybody. Leftovers. I don't see how he did it. Ephesians chapter 3. I'll have to show you. Chapter, chapter 3, verse number 19. Let's read it slow. To know the love of Christ, 
which passes knowledge. That means we don't understand it. Just like they don't understand how this happened. How in the world did he do it? That's why we call it a miracle. We can't understand it. His love passes our understanding. We're just human. Feeble-minded. You can never understand how he does what he does. That's why he's God. That's what makes him God. Keep reading. Oh, hold on. You might be what? Mm, mm, mm. They ate till they were what? They ate till they were filled. That you might be filled with what? Uh huh. Filled in fullness. Keep reading. Uh, Reggie, get Luke 6.38. He said, read, read that last part again about exceedingly. Exceedingly and abundantly. Now, we know when they finished eating, they had what? They had an abundance. They had leftover. He's telling you right here in Ephesians. This is the guy. That's what he does. He does more than you can understand with less than you can imagine and gives you an abundance of it. More than you could believe. Why did that kid give it? Why did that kid give it to him? Maybe he read Luke chapter 6, verse 38. What does it say? Hold on. Give, and it shall be given to you. So he, the little boy knows that if, if I give Jesus this, I know it's going to be given to me. But it's not just going to be given to me. It's going to be given to me what? A good measure. Pressed down. Y'all remember when I did that first sermon? And I brought out the laundry. I always got props. I brought out the laundry basket. I told you when I was a freshman in college, yeah. how I didn't do my laundry but once a month. And I had to get the laundry basket. It, it was only so big, but I had a pile of clothes about this big, and I had to shove it all in there, press it down, shake it together. But it was still what? What's the rest of the verse say? It was running over. He's going to give you more than you can carry. He's going to give you more than you can push into that basket. That little boy knew that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We was talking about this on Wednesday night a few weeks ago. These people, these three Hebrew boys, never saw Jesus. They never heard about the miracles. They never saw him walk on water. They never saw him resurrected. They didn't see him crucified. They were just told to have faith in him. That little bit of faith that they had, without even seeing that stuff, was enough for them to stand up to the king. It was enough for them to walk into the fire Boldly, without hesitation, not even certain that God was going to save them, but what they were certain is that he could save them. They did that with the little bit of faith without ever seeing anything that Jesus had done. These disciples saw it every single day, every single day, all day long. He was performing miracles till he was tired and they still doubted him. All it takes is just a little bit of faith. Take what little bit of little bitty problem you think you got, no matter how big you think it is, it ain't nothing next to God. That little problem you got, if he's if he's turning the world, if he can tell the water in the ocean, come here, stay right there, they call it high tide, and then after a couple of hours say, okay, now go back there and don't move till I tell you to, and call it low tide. You don't think he can move that person out of your way at work? You don't think you can move that brother out of your way that's getting on your nerves, that's talking about you behind your back? You don't think he can solve those marital problems that you got going on? You don't think he can get, tell the loan officer to give you that loan for that house? He's God. How many times does he have to show you that? Give God the little bits that you got and watch him turn them into an abundance. That's the lesson this morning. If you want to be able to be in a position to give your problems to God, he says, take your burdens to me and leave them there. You have to be a member of his church. How do you become a member of his church? You do it by hearing the gospel. You heard the gospel this morning. When people hear the gospel, they want to react to it. When people heard about them going up there, they heard that Jesus was there, they wanted to go. They wanted to see it for themselves. They believed it. When you believe, when you see something like that, you can't help but believe it, right? 
What they say? Seeing is believing. After you believe it, you confess it. Acts chapter 8 with the eunuch. He said, look, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? He said, well, do you, do you believe it? He said, yes, I believe. And then he confessed. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. I believe that. Do you believe that? How many times do we have to remind ourselves of that? How many times do you have to remind yourself of who you got? Stop worrying about what you got and remember who you got. They confessed it. They repented of their sins. And then the last thing he did was went down into the water. He was baptized. And he went on his way rejoicing. As Christians, we ought to be out in this world ripping and running just like these kids at the church without a worry in the world because we know that our Father is going to take care of us. If you're subject to the invitation, we ask you to stand while we sing, come while we together stand and sing.